Okay, welcome, uh, welcome back. Uh, my name is Sven Lütteken. I'll uh, be moderating this panel. Let me just begin um, by simply reading the description of this panel in the program. Uh, that way we'll all know what it is that we're supposed to discuss here. Uh, it says in the program, the ready-made was originally conceived by Marcel Duchamp as a strategy that wa would run counter to the logic of the market and jeopardize any economic value. However, the idea of a transfer from the quotidian into an art context has turned into a paradigm for value creation. The ready-made has become the favorite subject of speculators, speculators of capital as well as speculators of theory." End of quote. Now indeed, as we've already heard, uh, late in his life, uh, Duchamp was indeed very critical of art as financial speculation, and he evinced a kind of bohemian nostalgia for the time when life used to be cheap, when art was not a success story, when the artist hadn't become fully integrated into the culture industry yet. We might say nostalgia for a time of formal subsumption rather than real subsumption. However, let us not forget that uh, the ready-made came about during the First World War when one European country after another abandoned the gold standard and money became fiat money. And in some of his works uh, from the late 1910s and uh, early to mid-1920s, Duchamp also uh, responded to uh, the um, instability of the market, to the instability of, of value itself. We can think here, for instance, of Zank Zek from 19. 19, the fake check that he uh, created uh, to pay his dentist uh, with, or indeed uh, Monte Carlo Bond from 1924, which is listed as an imitated rectified ready-made in the catalogue raisonné, and which uh, was indeed an edition of Bond that Duchamp uh, sold to his uh, friends, to acquaintances, who would then um, have the right to uh, part of the profits to a share in the profits that he would make whilst gambling in Monte Carlo on the roulette. Um, and the Little Review in the United States, an important avant-garde magazine, uh, wrote about this Monte Carlo bond, I quote, if anyone is in the business of buying art curiosities as an investment, there is a chance to invest in a perfect masterpiece. Marcel's signature alone is worth much more than the 500 francs asked for the share. So, 1924. However, this was, of course, uh, something that was above all aimed at quite literally buying Duchamp time. So it wasn't necessarily about making huge profits, and indeed, as a money-making venture in Monte Carlo on the roulette wheel, it was a bust. Um, but it was indeed about buying time. About um, It was one of a number of uh, pieces, one of a number of strategies that Duchamp employed to uh, enable uh, his, uh, shall we say, lifestyle, his practice uh, as something that was uh, nearly invisible to the uh, art world at large and to the outside world, um, but that was sustainable, we might say. It was part of a certain ecology, and he was able to bide his time. Now, Duchamp also um, had a somewhat solipsistic theory, uh, which he defended quite seriously, to the effect that any real artwork only has a lifespan of some 20 years. He said this time and again, an artwork is alive for 20 years or so, then it becomes part of art history. You know, when it's successful, if it's canonized, it becomes art history and it's dead. It's no longer living um, art. This, we might say, is a, is a kind of bohemian, avant-garde understanding of the relation between art and art history. So we have living art on the one hand and then museified, canonized um, art uh, history on the other hand. You know, once the curators become involved, uh, basically you know that the art is dead. Um, so in that sense, Duchamp um, was far from inconsistent when, for instance, he began to um, work on his self-canonization in the mid to late 1930s with the Boite en Valise, or when he embraced the uses to which the ready-made uh, was put uh, around 1960 and throughout the 1960s in the context of Nouveau reali Realisme, uh, and so on. And when he agreed to have Arthur Schwartz produce editions of his ready-mates, he entered what he called his sex maniac phase. He said yes to everything. Um, but the art, at least the art uh, of circa 1950, 1917, uh, was uh, by that time, according to his own, let's say, ideology, um, dead, which also meant that it was open to constant reappropriation. 
uh, and he was not uh, one to resist any particular uh, reappropriation. It was all uh, good as far as, as far as he was concerned. Now, so many years later, in the year 2017, uh, we may well wonder, and this issue has already been raised a couple of times, um, what, if any, um, um, contemporary relevance and uh, potentiality we see in the ready-made in the ready-made um, principle. In some uh, cases, uh, we can discern um, a, a sort of turn for the worse that the uh, image, that the reputation of the ready-made has taken. The ready-made seems to have become a bad object for some because it is indeed associated with and seen as the the engine of a, a culture of speculation in uh, the financial, perhaps more so than in the theoretical sense. So Tanya Bouguera has put a uh, fountain back in the bathroom as a functioning uh, urinal, as a kind of manifesto of her notion of arte utile, of useful art, of art that is something else than an investment, and that has other uses, different uses. Of course, it's still visible as indeed a detour and ready-made, so the Duchampian gesture isn't um, erased. It is um, uh, negated, we might say, but there is no full um, erasure. It is still not quite a normal uh, functioning urinal. It is fountain kind of returned to uh, a use that Duchamp's gesture um, negated to uh, begin with. Uh, perhaps on a more sophisticated level, we could also think here of the aforementioned uh, Museum of Modern Art. I think uh, uh, Inke Arns already mentioned um, this uh, project, this praxis by the artist who must not be named, but who often uses the name of Walter Benjamin for his theoretical um, uh, statements. And uh, this Walter Benjamin has argued that uh, when antique sculptures were um, shown at the Belvedere, uh, during the Renaissance in the 16th century, they were not just the first objects of art, but they were actually the first ready-mades because they had not been uh, produced uh, for exhibition purposes in this early museum context. They were appropriated uh, by the Belvedere um, as um, basically the um, uh, fountainhead of uh, modern museological um, practices. And here's an installation shot of an exhibition by the Museum of American Art with indeed uh, paintings depicting some of the antiques um, shown and still to this day shown um, at the Vatican. The Vatican, which of course also uh, ho is hoarding, as Carter Atia, uh, I believe, has told us, a huge collection of African uh, artifacts from, uh, from the colonial era. Um, so yeah, in, both, um, in the case of both uh, Tanya Bouguera and the Museum of American Art, we might say that there is a desire to reverse the ready-made principle in a very fundamental sense. Walter Benjamin, the Museum of American Art, also argues that museums now need to be transformed uh, to no longer function as storage uh, um, uh, facilities for fetishes for commodity fetishes for ready-mates uh, and other fetishized objects they should be turned into different kinds of institutions that may indeed very well collect artifacts uh, but those artifacts should um, indeed function uh, differently and they should no longer be uh, objects of art they should no longer be uh, ready-mates in uh, in that sense now these are some thoughts that um, may perhaps also help us uh, uh, during the discussion um, and uh, the questions or the set of questions that we'll be dealing with in this panel above all revolve precisely about the contemporaneity, um, the anachronistic contemporaneity of Duchamp, of the ready-made in uh, today's um, financialized art world. So did Duchamp indeed with his de-skilled act um, turn the work into um, something akin to a financial asset? Did he help to create the conditions for today's art world? And if so, uh, are there ways of once again rereading the ready-made, uh, once again um, recognizing an, an as yet uh, untapped potentiality uh, in the ready-made? Um, can it still offer us conceptual tools, aesthetic strategies? Our three speakers will um, attack this cluster of questions in various ways, um, uh, discussing issues having to do with um, uh, immaterial labor, um, um, uh, dead labor, um, branding strategies, 
um, and so on. Uh, we will have three speakers who are all, I would stress, I would like to stress, a respondent, so we don't necessarily uh, adhere to this distinction between artistic statements and then, you know, the art historians or the theorists who are the respondents. We have one artist and we have um, uh, uh, art historians slash critics slash theorists, but they are all respondents to the overall problematic of this panel. And we begin with uh, Sebastian Egenhofer, um, who teaches, uh, who's a professor at the University of Vienna. Then we uh, proceed with Isabel Graf, who is among many other things, uh, a publisher of Texte zur Kunst. And uh, then we um, top it off with uh, Simon Denny, a Berlin-based artist whose work I'm sure you all know, and if not, you will encounter it today. Um, so, Sebastian, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks, uh, Sven, for the introduction, and uh, thanks to Ge Geta Daniel and the co-organizers um, for the invitation. Summarizing our precedent email exchange, uh, Sven noted that our statements would be about Duchamp, work or labor, Arbeit, time, and about value. I'll try to at least roughly confirm this prophecy, but I'll take a side entry. One of Duchamp's uh, posthumously published notes reads, a factory of sand paper for the exclusive use by Brancusi. In 1927, taking up the suggestion of the architect and designer Jean Prouvé, Brancusi had one of his newborns cast in stainless steel. But instead of the perhaps expected uh, perfection, it came out of this only quasi-industrial production process with a crumpled surface like the skin of a toad. And it had to be po polished all the more and all the longer by the artist's hand, or to be precise, by the sandpaper within the artist's hand. Only after this patient and, one could say, this motherly work, Brancusi used to carry his pieces at his body while polishing them, the newborn, smooth and shiny now, even though never as glossy as the Jeff Koons, would be placed on its pedestal that connects it to the vertical force of gravity and thus to the earth. A factory of sandpaper for the exclusive use by Brancusi Duchamp's aphorism relates this bodily labor back onto a strangely monumental and obscure site, the factory, where in a production process with a high proportion of machine labor, Brancusi's sandpaper was mass produced. This factory, Duchamp suggests, would really be the womb from which the newborn is born. The artist's hand, they did not do much to smoothen the surface of a stainless steel cast. The surface of the new, newborn is the imprint, or has to be read as the imprint, of the sandpaper, and by that of the factory, that is of the machines that produced the sandpaper in the first place. The contraindication that there obviously is no such factory that produces exclusively for Brancusi hints to a kind of belatedness of Brancusi's, Duchamp's good friend's artistic production. In his cult place like studio, with his natural materials, his archaic tools, and his lamb legs roasted on the fireplace. Duchamp's remark about this dubious factory should be related to his often discussed notes about the inframins the infra-thin or infra meager polishing and its effects, mirroring or shiny surfaces, together with moiré effects, are among the examples for the inframins mentioned by this Duchamp from the visual field. Another central example, however, are the disappearingly small differences, not of two cosmic eggs, but of two things of whatever kind, but produced in series, that is, descending from the same mold. If the maximum precision is reached, then the difference between two such serial products, two such casts from the same mold, is an example of the inframins. 
With the ready-mates, Duchamp took one such object directly from the factory, which means from a more or less standardized machine-based production process, able to and meant to reproduce the same object in the same quality in an endless series. The factory, thus, is the mold of the ready-made. What kind of labor, then, is involved in its production? In the case of Duchamp's classic ready-mades, there was probably still some handiwork in play. But the living labor involved in the production process of these relatively old-fashioned goods, made, by the way, from rather classical materials of sculpture, like metal, wood, ceramics, the living labor involved here is or was obviously superseded by the guiding rules of serial production to reproduce a given prototype. And even in a small factory, these rules are not implemented as a linguistic prescription alone. They are materialized in and as the tools and machines that are used in the production process. The substance of these tools and machines the substance that makes them functional in the production of nearly identical objects is not this or that material as such, but this substance is the past labor that is sedimented in them. The one mold of the factory is able to produce a principally endless chain of identical objects, not because its tools and machines are made of more resistant materials of harder materials than the flow of the raw matter on which they imprint their form. The difference of the factory and the commodities which are minted or cast or produced in it has to be put in economical terms as the difference of fixed and variable capital. The commodities descending from the factory in an endless chain belong to the small circulation of consumer goods. They are meant to be consumed in as quick a circle of renewal as the market allows. The built-in obsolescence of the product drives this circulation and necessita necessitates quicker reproduction. The machines and the factory, however, on the other hand, belong to the much slower investment cycle. They are used as long as possible to produce as many consumer goods as possible. And their value, that is the living labor that was historically incorporated in them in the first place, this value of the machines is given over to its product only at a very slow rate in exact proportion to their own tearing and shaping. So if a machine doesn't uh, destroy itself while producing the objects, uh, it does just is gives no, uh, no value to the products, that you can use it endlessly. So Duchamp takes an object that, being a more or less serial product, carries the imprint of, or even is the imprint, of the dead labor, which is the substance of the mold of the factory. And he takes these objects ready-made to fair without that intermediary transformation that makes a coarse piece of metal into an iridescent sculpture or that makes some tube of, pa of paint into a painting by Seurat. He takes one of these nearly identical objects and at a certain point in time, in the case of the comb, it seems to have been February 17, 1916, 11 a.m., at a certain point in time, he inscribes it with a kind of signature, a poetical sentence without normal sense, as he puts it, and with a date. This choice and inscription of an already made object has to be understood as Duchamp's conceptualization of artistic production. The choice is what one has to think of as artistic production with Duchamp. But what then is it that he has produced in this way? Since obviously it's not the object as such which was already there. At the center of Duchamp's conception of the ready mates is their relation to his chef d'oeuvre, the large glass. I will 
make a little excursion on that to answer this question, what it is that he has produced if it's not the object as such. I won't go in any details, but only try to sketch the formal or abstract frame of the relation between the ready-mades and the large glass. The large glass has one, among many, one basic structural interest, and that's an interest that relates it also to the painting of the nude descending a staircase. And this interest is the relationship of the synchronous image space to movement and time. Duchamp frames this as an interest in a higher dimension and a different kind of perspective. Not that of the reduction and representation of a three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional plane, but of a four-dimensional continuum in or on a three-dimensional space. One line of the argument about this relation of dimensions is very simple. If a point, a continuum of zero dimensions, cuts a one-dimensional line. If a line cuts a two-dimensional plane. If a two-dimensional plane cuts a three-dimensional space, then by analogy, obviously, space, the three-dimensional space we live in, must be thought of as a cut through a four-dimensional continuum. The organizing questions in the notes related to the large glass are thus the following. Can we conceive, can we construct a perspective in which a three-dimensional space is marked and made perceivable as such a cut through a four-dimensional continuum? And can this cut be framed and filled in such a way that it opens up just as the plane of a perspectival painting opens to an illusionistic space? Can this frame, that, uh, can this cut that is the space be conceived in such a way that it opens to the semblance, a kind of illusion, a kind of four-dimensional depth? That would be the analogy. During the long work at the large glass, Duchamp invented a bunch of methods to conceive such a cut through the continuum of four-dimensional space-time and also such a kind of projection of four-dimensional perspective. One of the most famous one is this here. One of these methods is the dust breeding, the projection over a period of several months of the dust and of all that breathable air that carried the dust particles while they sank down following the law of gravity on the backside of the glass, resulting in this densified state, or as Duchamp put it, in a reversed image of porosity. The four-dimensional continuum is this time-space in which the plane of the glass, after the fixing of the dust, function as an even only two-dimensional cut. So the four-dimensional continuum are these four to six months or whatever, or three to four, the different notes, while the dust sinks on the, on the surface. And this is what he conceives as a four-dimensional perspective, as a kind of projection in which the uh, dimension of time is integrated. The ready-mates relate to these reflections about perspective in the following way. How can we mark, is the question, how can we mark in this three-dimensional space in which we breathe and live and from which we can't escape, that it is only a cut. How can we conceive of the present space as something ultra thin in a way, like a cut, like a mere separation in a higher dimensional continuum? The answer is simple, by inscribing it with its present date. To do this, you need a clean surface. And the ready-made provides this material support of a sometimes quite precise state and a kind of signature, the inscription of this poetic sentence that Duchamp writes on its body to discern it from all its mate, from all its kumpels, like the ses copains, uh, which descend from the same mole, which carry the imprint of the same dead labor of the same factory. From this moment of its singular singularization onwards, from this moment of the inscription of the date, the ready-made, as the carrier of its, its date, 
begins to differentiate itself from itself, second by second, by and with the progress of time. So Duchamp didn't obviously produce this object, just as Seurat didn't produce his tubes of paint or Michelangelo his marble, etc. What he produced is not the object, but the never-ending process of its reception, of its exposure to its spectators or onlookers who made it and, uh, who made it and continu continue to make it into an image or into a work of art. Duchamp's product, the product of his living labor, the labor of choosing the object, of dating and framing it, and of organizing its public afterlife, as he did with this photograph of Alfred Stieglitz, Duchamp's product is this very process of an always unfinished reception process in which the material object, which he didn't produce, is but a kind of catalyst. That this catalyst is a more or less industrially produced object is basic for Duchamp's conception because it must provide a clean surface for the inscription of the date. To provide the process of its reception with a clean starting point, the object as such shouldn't bring with it any evocations of meaning or any individual prehistory as prominently the surrealist objects Trouvé do. The use of a serial product, a commodity, is thus method methodologically necessary for Duchamp's conceptions, but uh, for, for Duchamp's conce conception of the ready-made, but the commodity status of the work itself is not at all an issue. All the less so since the ready-made as the processual work of art, or as this work process that starts in the moment of dating, the ready-made is in no way identical with its object carrier, or with all these object carriers to which it's uh, the original um, object that was, uh, was signed and dated or was inscribed is multiplied during the work process, which remains one process, with one non-reproducible point in time where it starts, namely sometime in 1914, even if it multiplies like uh, is here documented in this collection that Lars Blunk made and gave me. Uh, thank you to him again. Only with the strong wave of the ready-made reception in the 1950s and 1960s, the identification of the artwork with the absolute commodity and identification latent in minimal art and programmatic in Andy Warhol. This uh, identification of artwork and absolute commodity became in a way retroactively a central feature of an only now so-called ready-made strategy. Since then we can of course follow the reception of Duchamp's since the 1950s one could say with this focus on the fetish and uh, the commodity form, a lineage that would include also parts of the most interesting forms of appropriation art and uh, would lead, of course, to something like Jeff Koons, also later pieces of Jeff Koons, which I don't show. Historically more important seems to me a feature of art since the 1960s, which uh, we can't account as an influence of Duchamp, but which narrowly relates to points brought up by and with the ready-made, and I mean, the unprecedented amount of dead labor that is involved in and unquestioningly accepted in so much artistic production since the 1960s. It's the dead labor sedimented, for example, in the industrial materials used by Donald Chad, or it's the dead labor sedimented in the machine of the photo camera or in the silk, in the silk screen used by Andy Warhol. And it's this dead labor, of course, that enables seriality in minimal and pop art. And it's the dead labor that allows also the production of, say, classical conceptual works like Lawrence Wiener's two minutes of spray can, uh, of spray paint directly up on the floor from a standard aerosol can. This is the factory of this ready-made, the standard aerosol can. And it enables this 
deviant reproduction or restaging by Stephen Prina as on his own work directly on a white Guyton Epsom printer painting. So we see here that uh, the factory or the mold uh, can be a JPEG, um, it can be as in Oliver Larik's work, it can be um, a, a file, a data file to use for 3D printing. Here we are in the realm, realm where the production of art is channeled by the labor <coughs> sedimented in the apparatuses and machines of nowadays. To call this a legacy of Duchamp would personalize, wrongly personalize, I think, a broad and inescapable condition of artistic and of all kind, any kind of production in a highly industrialized society. But to look about uh, this present form from a, uh, about, uh, to look at this present from a Duchampian point of view might still be useful and clarifying. I hope that we can uh, discuss about it. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Sven, for the introduction and thank you, Dieter Daniels, for having invited me. Um, my statement is an attempt, and I'm saying this in a way that is maybe not modest enough, it's an attempt to provide a critical economy of the ready-made uh, in 10 minutes. Uh, it's called reconsidering the ready-made. Um, the ready-made is, and this has been mentioned already, a found object, a tout fait, as Marcel Duchamp also liked to call it. Duchamp started to purchase these objects, such as the bicycle wheel, which he mounted onto a stool from 1913 onwards. There is thus an act of consumption implied in the ready-made. And this, of course, has a long-lasting effect on how we conceive of artistic competence, as I will briefly demonstrate in the following statement. But apart from relativizing the importance of traditional artistic skills, the ready-made also consists of the social labor of others, such as the labor of those manufacturer workers who produced it, as John Roberts has convincingly argued. The ready-made indeed implies social labor, but I will add to this argument that social labor also gets eclipsed in it at the same time. By containing social labor and rendering it invisible and dead, the ready-made structurally seems to resemble the commodity fetish as described by Karl Marx. However, in my perspective, the ready-made also remains, and this is important, it remains a commodity of a special kind. And this is due to the social privileges associated with artistic labor, such as the artist who's not selling her labor force, but a product that is furthermore tied to her via authorship, or such as her comparatively more autonomous work situation. And it is these privileges, these privileges of artistic labor that are also captured in the ready-made, to my mind, and turn it turn it into a commodity of a special kind. Because ready-mades are saturated, not only with social, but also with artistic labor, they have furthermore served as a blueprint for luxury goods, which are often modeled after them. So I have two points now. One first point, headline, de-skilling actually means reskilling. The ready-made not only changed the way we think about artists and their practices today, it also implied new possibilities and problems that still reach into our present. In many art historical accounts, the ready-made is assumed to relativize authorship and to allow for a process of so-called de-skilling, since the artist now chooses an object instead of literally creating it. But when looking more closely at ready-mades, one realizes that traditional artistic skills don't get entirely abolished in them. They rather get 
reconfigured and reformulated. Skills thus get expanded and now consist of cognitive immaterial skills as well. And this, of course, points to the increased worth of immaterial labor in today's neoliberal economy. The artist thus rises to the position of a meta-author who initiates a specific experimental setup. She moreover turns, one could say, to a, man to a managerial artist type that we often encounter in today's art world. An artist manager who at times exploits the labor of others. What is equally captured in the ready-made, I would argue, are the new competences expected from artists in a media society. For instance, when Duchamp chose to define himself as a mediumistic being, as someone who is thus permeable and appears to be object-like, he reminds us of the necessity for artists to stage themselves like an object, to cultivate a convincing persona, a necessity that has only increased since Duchamp's time. And Duchamp was, of course, very good at staging himself. The lesser emphasis he put on his artistic production, the more carefully he worked on the production of his artistic self, a shift that we can also detect in the work of many post-war artists. Point two, the ready-made as a commodity of a special kind. I already hinted to the fact that the labor of other people, such as the labor of the manufacturer workers, is both implied in the ready-made and rendered invisible in it. This is why one can say that it structurally resembles the commodity fetish as Karl Marx described it. Because according to Marx, the secret of the commodity form is that it, I quote, reflects the social character of man's labor back to them as an objective character stamped upon the product of that labor. The commodity, in other words, mystifies the labor conditions that produced it, its own social dimension, by presenting these labor conditions to us at its, as its own intrinsic quality. That is why, as Marx put it, commodities appear as independent beings, and therein lies their fetishism. Like fetishes, they are experienced as quasi-living and self-acting beings because the social character of the labor expended on making them is both rendered invisible in them and perceived as their own nature. This is why they appear as quasi-alive. Quasi now, while ready-mates certainly can appear as having a life of their own, there are also, unlike ordinary commodities, unique material objects assigned to an individual, individual author. Their unique, uniqueness is getting preserved, for instance, when limited editions are produced of them. These objects are indeed directly associated with the singular individuality of their creator initiator. A close nexus between the person of the artist and her product is implied here, which gets authentified by the signature or the inscription and by the attribution to an author that follows from that. Now, by containing and eclipsing the labor of others, by transforming their labor into their seemingly natural features, ready-mates seem somewhat alive, saturated with a social dimension. But next to this social labor, artistic labor is also implied by them, namely the cognitive labor of their author, a managerial type that ready-mates also evoke. So ready-mates are not only saturated with social labor conditions, but also somewhat contain the social privileges of artistic labor. And this is what makes them so attractive and irresistible in today's economy. I think it's symptomatic in this respect that luxury items are modeled after the ready-made, since the ready-made 
uh, are models after the ready-made, as when, for instance, limited editions of handbags get produced, or when luxury brands create narratives that suggest a long history and an, and an author for these serial objects, such as Louis Vuitton. It should have become clear by now that I don't consider the ready-made to be an innocent or emancipatory proposition. Ready-mades are interesting to me because of their highly problematic nature, because of how they are implicated in the capitalist system. And finally, they also remind us of the artist's problematic class position, of how artists are structurally associated with the ruling classes, even if their own financial situation remains precarious. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for having me. Dita, yeah, Sven, thanks for the introduction. Isabel, I think I have some, um, yeah, resonances with some of the things you raised, um, which is cool as well. Oh, there we go. Okay. Since the moment of the ready-made's creation uh, and subsequent popularization and canonization, much has changed in the way we experience the relevant forces that emerged from and responded to. Um, as has been identified by many in this conference already, the production of art is not only very different, but so is the commercial and political context the ready-made was produced under. Um, we no longer live in the paradigm of the human-run factory, and resultant mass commodities for uh, mass uh, worker markets with politics and labor relations of the early or mid-20th century. Um, if a urinal were produced today, it would very likely com be completely made by machine with zero human uh, labor involved, and this is a lights-off um, factory, uh, so nobody works there, um, apart from machines. Um, under our emerging and accelerating paradigm of platform capitalism, or cognitive capitalism, or computational capitalism, whatever you call it, um, th the site of human labor and value extraction is increasingly in looking, liking, retweeting, and chatting. Communication itself has become the value extractive process. Um, affective um, and communicative labor, which is at the moment only monetized and indeed only monetizable um, as ever more accurate and targetable advertising eyeballs, uh, by a small number of giant uh, global or large region regional, in the case of China or, or maybe Russia, um, commercial and governmental organizations like Netflix, uh, Facebook, Amazon, etc., um, is always in dialogue with the aggregating network effects of platforms. Yeah. Uh, when I was asked to relate my work somehow to the context of the ready-made, um, I, uh, I reached out to Sven, uh, who suggested that my work's appropriation of an intervention in corporate design and branding might be relevant um, as a kind of, as he said, uh, post-ready-made post strategy focusing not on specific objects but on organizations and their self-presentation. Sounds good. Um, <laughs> I'm going to try and do that. <laughs> um, if platforms are increasingly the site of labor extraction today, and what is indeed ready-made um, comes in the form of identities, maybe, and in infinitely categorizable or subcategorizable markets, um, organizational aggregators and their aggregating algorithms are the dominant cultural formulators in our experience. Um, the ready-made as organization presentation is witness to the effects of um, of, acti of organizational rhetoric narrating technology uh, to the effects of innovators and organizations as um, political actors changing the site of labor. Indeed, perhaps in a way changing up, uh, catching up to a weird uh, reading that I thought of of Duchamp's uh, site of production uh, reinterpreted uh, in today's labor paradigm of looking, promoting, and sharing, of speculation as rhetoric, of documentation and context as maker, and of looking as outsourced labor for capital. Within, with the ready-made, Duchamp maybe becomes the platform, um, the container for increased value by those who made the artwork, the humans and machines in the factory producing the object, the rejected salon, the photographer and the zine as circulation, and the labor of who we look at and compete uh, and complete the work in our encounter of it, plus the labor of canon creating museums, collectors, galleries, and journals. The ready main retains all of that value as an aggregative platform, maybe. Um, 
Anyway, uh, my work in recent years has been in some ways an attempt to grapple with the fact that culture is made in the shadow of these larger structures. That whether we know it or not, like it or not, these are the formulations and forces that frame our experiences and agency. Here are a few highlights from my projects that interrogate that space, that try to unpack the narratives given to us by these powerful actors and highlight the gaps between the message they want to give us and our experience of those stories as a, as a kind of register of the dominant and emergent narratives offered to us as they shape our lives and experience. I'll look at three projects today that play on this with differing dynamics. One that looks at a prominent German tech conference in 2012, possibly the height of the making of Web 2.0, I would say. Um, the emergent web of value or Web 3.0 will be my next kind of project snippet um, of blockchain, which was mentioned yesterday. Um, a whole new value paradigm, I would say. And a project uh, from this year that looked at the rhetoric and politics of one of the strongest oppositions to this paradigm from within another conference to do with tech, this time at the European Parliament, which is, by the way, I think the only credible opposition to, um, to growing platform capitalism. Um, uh, <coughs> so this is oh, yeah. This is a poster uh, for All You Need Is Data, a project that I developed at first at the Munich Kunstverein in 2012, which inci incidentally Oliver Larrick was um, speaking at. Um, and uh, my first attempt in interpreting these uh, those individuals and organizations responsible for building and scaling Web 2.0. This person is perhaps one of the most politically impacting figures of this group who perhaps unintentionally built the context and infrastructure for the direction of politics and culture today. Um, his name is Chris Poole, better known by the online uh, name of Moot. Poole was responsible for the building of the now infamous, then a little bit obscure, in wider culture maybe, um, called a uh, platform called 4chan, which is generally thought of as where memes were born, as a format where anonymous activists came together, and uh, as now recently uh, thought of as one of the most important sites of production for the new right movements that um, narrated the cultural shift in the states towards Trump, if not directly impacted on, um, on his ascension. Um, here's the poster, sits, al sits alongside um, one of the most revealing things that s was said at the conference as he was speaking it, um, uh, the, the DLD uh, Digital Life Design Conference in Munich, um, it, uh, said at a keynote by another very powerful actor or cultural figure um, and business person, Sheryl Sandberg, um, the CEO of Facebook at the time. Um, so she said, yeah, uh, a lot of the new rules are being written by the people who don't even know they're writing them. Um, uh, for the exhibition, I transcribed and edited all footage of the conference and reissued it in, in an edited version, which I felt contained the most poignant and telling quotes from this group. I distilled the aesthetics and experience um, of the conference as part of this message. The set here that you see um, is an elaborate form of stage design um, derived from a TV set design and made for webcast. This represents a kind of future Alps, um, apparently, and this is a kind of sister stage um, which it kind of represented a kind of woody interior, which was an Alps of the past. So the kind of the passing of time was created and, and contained within the set design. Um, then I uh, edited, well, yeah, then I edited quotes uh, that were in these panels um, and, and printed them in a graphic style that exaggerated the dominant iOS platform of the time. Um, obviously, this was um, iOS 5, I think, and everybody at this conference uh, was using iPhone already, um, which is pretty interesting. That's a little snippet there. Um, it's called, uh, oh, there we go. It's called school amorphism, um, but it wasn't only used a, as a slide design. It was, yeah, it wasn't only just a kind of um, interface design. It was also kind of used in slide design um, during the conference. Here are evidenced in Brian Chesky of Airbnb slide, carrying his main point for this talk, a phrase which today seems frankly ridiculous, um, as platform capitalism has proved its opposite to be true. The idea that access is more powerful than ownership is directly, yeah, uh, ironic. Um, uh, back to Paul, um, uh, here he is, uh, here's the stage he spoke on again, and here the canvas I designed and printed, uh, <coughs> uh, reflecting on the stage uh, um, and, uh, and uh, framing these quotes. So um, here he says, many people are underestimating how public they are on social networks. People don't understand. Data is the oil of the 20th century. You cannot have real freedom of speech without being able to be anonymous. Not sure if that's true anymore. Um, no, I don't think privacy is dead yet, etc. cetera. Uh, 2012 was, a, was an uh, innocent time. Um, here, the Woody stage, two generations of influential value fa uh, Valley family, Silicon Valley family, the Dysons, uh, with some more revealing quotes. Um, the world is, uh, is uh, 
unfortunately driven more by politics than facts, um, and I certainly believe very strongly in the privatization of human space. Kind of nice uh, pr pair to like talk about Silicon Valley values. Um, I organized this material into another format that underlined the inflexibility of the space, um, uh, the, the directive uh, feeling of being on the Facebook timeline, which is now our feed, um, where all canvases face triumphantly forward and looking back to the past, uh, as you walked through the timeline physically, uh, you could see nothing. Um, I was also, it was also a dead end. So once you reached uh, Sandberg's final keynote, where she said that quote that I quoted before, you had to turn around and retrace your steps back through the skeuomorphic paintings. Um, the last slide, uh, yeah, the last kind of uh, canvas I want to kind of look at, um, a few quotes uh, from Twitter founder Jack Dorsey. Again, something that's increased in political value. I think that services like Twitter make possible a more direct democracy based on feedback. And uh, I believe that free information helps the world. Um, yeah. Uh, now uh, to another project. So uh, blockchain future states, uh, uh, shown in Berlin last year at Berlin's at, at yeah at last year's Berlin Biennale, grappled with the reflecting of the narratives accompanying the emergent web paradigm of the so-called web of value or Web 3.0. Uh, defined uh, by anticipated widespread adoption of blockchain, the software that the, uh, the network's distributed computing infrastructure protocol birthed and popularized with Bitcoin. Um, this emergent web has yet to see its full impact, but its growth and level of investment in capital and talent is vast and quick, uh, and its critics are as strong as its proponents. Those who are pro are often wildly utopic and say it will be the people's answer to the dominance of these aggregating platforms, um, where participants who build products and services on it effectively own equity in their own projects as they build through the appreciation of fi financial value, through attention value that could be captured and stored in these kind of new liquid digital tokens associated with any business or identity. Um, those who criticize the emergent platform call it out as hypermonetization of the web, where micropayments could effectively make charging for even an email very possible, and whose liquidity and tendency to be beyond normal financial regulatory checks um, c uh, and balances come through the existing centralized financial systems between banks and states promise a kind of mainstreaming of the financial logic of free marketism. Um, and, a w and Wall Street across all networks. So if you think we live in a financialized world today, just wait for the blockchain. Um, they also point out that the distrust of centralized banking systems has echoes of possible anti-Semitism. They're also critical of the fact that Austrian economics like Hayek's um, principles of self-organizing markets has been very influential to the development of that technology. Uh, anyway, so here the perfect venue um, uh, I thought, for questioning this possibly inevitable direction uh, in global information technology. Um, a, a global school, uh, uh, yeah, a global technology and management school um, in the shell of a former communist institution, the Staatsratsgebäude. Here in the, dis uh, in, in, uh, yeah, in this, in a kind of a disused room, um, I presented three fictitious trade fair booths about the real about three real blockchain companies, each boldly showcasing their vision for blockchain, each with a novelty uh, postage stamp design as their centerpiece. So I made a kind of a collaboration with a stamp designer um, who works on the Bundespost stamps here in Berlin. Um, Stamps, for me, were a way to distill uh, and foreground the issues um, that I saw as having most impact on the familiar, uh, on in one familiar object. Stamps are symbols for the financial system accompanying distribution. They're exclusively issued by states and contain themes and values endorsed by such states. The venue also allowed a, an, a dialogue with aesthetic choices and symbolism of organizations in different paradigms, foregrounding technology as a key aspect of utopic visions. Um, in fact, here in the empty, still unused room of the former communist room of the GDR contains uh, a leftover aluminum illustrated sound insulation mural, kind of, at the back there, depicting a dove uh, flying over smokestacks and test tubes. Industrial technology leads to peace. The first organization I used um, the identity of was Digital Asset, a company founded by um, banking superstar, um, uh, at Blythe Masters, who worked at JP Morgan in the 1990s developing credit default swaps, um, who generated the biggest seed funding round in history for this company, um, 
And uh, this version of blockchain, uh, if enacted by this company and scaled up beyond all other models, would see centralized banking keep its monopoly on the monetary system, where blockchain would essentially automate a, a bunch of processes usually done by people, causing banks to lower costs and trade faster, no doubt inventing more financial innovation along the way. As is in some of the most conservative versions of blockchains, uh, the aesthetics are, cl uh, I, I wanted, as, as her version was the most conservative version, I wanted the aesthetics to be close to banking. The booth is classical. There's fake woodcuts, and the form of stamp design um, derives from, uh, deri yeah, derives from kind of British Queen's Head classics. The twist on the design is, um, is there's kind of like a centralized network um, diagram uh, that, that kind of builds into the design. Bly's classical heads skew towards the American Federal Reserve System's headquarters in the center. Um, the next booth and next company is um, 21.co, whose uh, then vision for Bitcoin was that it would become a, super, uh, a supranational monetary system uh, protocoled um, into the our internet as the money protocol, enabling a total synthesis of money to the web. This was intended to promote a money system beyond nation states and supported um, uh, Balaji Srivinasan, the founder's ver vision for exit, a notion elaborated in a talk given at startup school Y Combinator in 2012, where building nations outside of existing systems is lusted for. Here the booth is more kind of decentralized in its language. Uh, the kind of language of a network-like trust system makes up a less conventional design, and the aesthetics of the presenter are more kind of street. Um, the stamp has uh, the stamp that I made with him um, has a has a uh, has an asymmetrical design um, and features 21's computers built for those programming on top of the Bitcoin protocol floating over a stylized version of Silicon Valley. It's a uh, in a tweet which I um, extrapolated into the booth design and the stamp. Srivinitsan spoke of the nationalist land versus the technologist cloud, an emergent vision of the dividing lines of the future under blockchain. Um, the final and most disruptive booth, um, imagine Vitalik Buterin's Ethereum um, as defining the future of blockchain, a prediction that right now looks to be not so far off. Um, uh, Ethereum's token, um, Ether, gained in value roughly 5,000% since I made its installation. And those working on some of the most prominent companies in the blockchain space work with its smart contract enabling uh, blockchain as their basis. Companies building on this network claim to create decentralized autonomous organizations and even nation states where a new form of collective governance happens on the blockchain. The booth at this time literally rips a hole in the floor of the communists' um, uh, carpet and the stamps uh, format is kind of almost eating itself. Um, its perforations are destroying the form of the stamp. The aesthetic is taken from gaming. Uh, magic style card paintings uh, depicts Vitalik flying above the earth um, with network theorist Paul Barron and the familiar Hayek and von Mises in the background. Um, the questioning of, uh, of rhetoric practice of those who most effectively oppose and disagree with Silicon Valley uh, is the final project, um, which I want to uh, talk about very briefly. Um, uh, in June this year, I was invited to speak at a summit at the European Parliament, um, really the only regulatory body, as I said, that challenges global tech in any kind of depth. The summit looked at the EU's role in the next generation internet over two days. I attended with a group of critical artists and friends and brought along a top level graphic facilitator, a genre of live illustration native to tech conferences where um, a live felt tip drawing is generated to illustrate the speakers as they speak. Um, so here she is uh, working with me. Um, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, Instead of illustrating the rhetoric of the speakers directly, the editing process, I used this time, uh, uh, I asked the illustrator to live illustrate a feed of critical commentary generated by me and the other attendant artists and critics I came with, um, and the official voice of the parliamentary speakers. The illustrator was here performing the position of today's internet user, forced to synthesize official narratives from news services, services or politicians, and competing counter-narratives from a cacophony of social feedback channels. Here is a, uh, oh yeah, this is what the kind of uh, drawings then look like, a kind of, um, yeah, aggregation of both uh, official narrative and, um, and kind of feedback response. Um, and, uh, and here is, uh, here's some little uh, moments from it um, where, where there's, yeah, kind of moments that she kind of distilled from what we were saying. 
Um, and then I, I uh, then represented it um, in, in, in the parliament. Uh, re re yeah, I restaged the drawings as produced in the parliament in the Beaux-Arts in another part of Brussels a couple months later that again recalls the timeline of one of my DV DLD flannels to kind of full circle it here. An existing language of drawing, uh, the visual language of TEPT conferences, reflects on the official voice of parliament as reinterpreted, trolled, and criticized from, um, from hybrid uh, visual language. Uh, feedback as a critical service. Um, that's that's all I'll say today. Yeah, thank you, uh, thank you all very much. I think indeed there are plenty of uh, resonances uh, between the various. Um, presentations, uh, certainly between uh, Simons and Isabel's, but also between uh, uh, Simons and Sebastian's, I thought, for instance, that Sebastian's focus on uh, the ready-made as, as procedure, as, as process, rather than as um, first and foremost an object, uh, is also uh, rather productive in relation to, um, you know, to Simons' uh, strategies and, um, and operations, also the, the emphasis in uh, Sebastian's talk on the issue of, of timing. Uh, the ready-made is something that is signed and, uh, and dated and, and timed um, uh, is something we might want to elaborate, for instance, also in relation to, um, uh, to the blockchain. But perhaps let me just ask one question and then, one question and then we'll see where uh, we can take it from there about um, labor, um, dead labor, um, social labor. Um, because here there is another um, resonance uh, between Sebastian focusing on dead labor in uh, industrial production and then um, you at a certain point, uh, uh, um, sort of near the beginning of your talk, you showed us this uh, slide of this factory and then you said uh, zero human labor is involved. Um, and um, I'm wondering whether um, there is also a risk involved both in dealing with industrial capitalism and in dealing with contemporary production methods in, um, let's say, overprivileging um, dead labor. Um, this, I thought, was you know, a, a point where we can almost read uh, perhaps Isabel's presentation as a kind of um, critique of the other two presentations in that uh, Isabel stressed um, that um, the ready-made uh, implies and contains, uh, but also obscures and obfuscates uh, living labor, human labor. Um, so if we focus on, uh, let's say, uh, the labor that has been sedimented in, in uh, the form of apparatuses, as Sebastian puts it, um, obviously this is something that um, this process of sedimentation is going on a pace, no question about it. But even if we have this kind of shiny factory today, are there not always forms of human labor, for, for instance, perhaps the extraction of minerals somewhere in Africa, um, that actually um, gets uh, hidden behind those fascinating, wonderful images that we are shown of those completely autonomous um, uh, factories. Um, so yeah, perhaps uh, this question can sort of trigger responses from all of you or any of you, um, anybody want to respond I, to it? Yeah, I can respond. I mean, I think there's, uh, the lights off factory is not necessarily a triumph. Mm. Um, and that's certainly not what I was kind of positioning no, no, it as sure. in my, in my, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's the, it's actually a symbol for most people of like, uh, uh, loss of jobs. That's, that's what that, that's what that image usually yeah. represents. So I think it's certainly not about obscuring uh, labor with a with a kind of glittery image it's about um, uh, noting that labor is being shunted elsewhere and mm -hmm. the types of yeah. labor that used to be paid and done by humans unfortunately is now done by machines and the t and the, the point that I was trying to make is that actually the labor that now humans are often doing which is looking and sorting and doing things which uh, maybe uh, as I say hopefully made the ready-made get value are actually being monetized and, and and economic value is gained from at another point Certainly not in a space where the subject is able to be uh, mm -hmm. um, benefiting from that. No, sure. So it's not about obscuring mm -hmm. uh, labor that happens elsewhere. It's it's about the loss of the possibility for paid labor, um, however badly. Well, paid. there's a, a kind of double displacement towards sites of, of extraction of, of you know where the raw materials are being extracted, and then towards um, semiotic labor um, 
Right, and but so mining yeah. will not be yeah. done by humans in the future. It, mm. it will not. Mm. So that those yeah. jobs, however no. shitty they are, will also disappear. No. So yes, but yeah. I think, I mean, one could, of course, um, raise objects, objections against my use of Marx's labor value theory by saying that I accord a kind of transhistorical trans trans historical validity to uh, concepts that aimed at an industrial society. And we are obviously uh, living in an economy where industrial production has not disappeared. It has been outsourced to so-called, you know, um, cheap labor uh, countries. But uh, nevertheless, we are also dealing with a so-called financialized uh, capitalism. And one could wonder whether, you know, the whole idea of a commodity that uh, eclipses labor and nevertheless relates to labor can still be maintained in such an economy. And I would say yes. And I would say that you can find, uh, you know, a, a reflection on that in Marx as well, because he he kind of insists very much on how the, how the circuits of production are intricately related to the sphere of uh, distribution, distribution and circulation, and he uh, quite thoroughly analyzes also credit and basically points to how all these instruments of credit, you know, nowadays we speak a lot of derivate, derivatives, how they seem to be completely, you know, disconnected from labor, but on some level, of course, they are based on exploiting labor as well and on surplus value. So, so I mean, I think that's why it's in a way legitimate, and I should possibly have said that in my statement, to, to, to use Marx for the type of economy that you are interested in. Yeah dealing with. Yeah. Absolutely. I would say, actually, you don't even need to look that far. I would say, I I as I formulated it, hopefully, maybe not clear enough, um, Facebook is exactly that thing. Uh, you know, the platforms are that thing. The labor is obscure. Like, you don't know you're giving your data for money to them. You and just and, and you and don't yes. even get, you know, you don't even get exploited. I mean, you don't well, you, you don't get any money for it. You you don't right. you know you you, you, you do it completely for free. So it's, it's a slave. Yeah. yeah. So it's really perfect perfect labor, purified labor. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Now, and you um, do you want to respond to this? Uh, uh, I, I would perhaps ask Isabel a point that I didn't get and that relates to um, to relates to the discussion. I don't know what you. What do you mean uh, by when you say this, that a social labor is eclipsed in, in, in the ready-made? Mm -hmm. I cannot imagine how, how could it not be eclipsed in, in, this, in this kind of... Well, of course, it's not a, a strictly industrial production, uh, mostly, but uh, anyway, it disappears in the product. Yeah, well, uh, then compare what it... What does Duchamp uh, yeah. um, add I'm to this? I think you, you need to compare... When you compare the ready-made, say, to a painting, the painting, um, and I'm assuming here an expanded notion of painting, meaning you know that it can also be a, a painted screen or it doesn't have to be oil on ca canvas, but the painting nevertheless highly triggers the fantasy that its value has substance, that the concrete labor of the artist has been somewhat how can I say sedimented in it that tr you can find traces of these labor, yeah, of and this is so this is a this is a suggestion. This is a how can I say this is a this is triggered by paintings and 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 the fantasy I call it vitalist fantasies that uh, that are triggered by painting are also occasioned by them by their materiality, um, and uh, I think the um, um, the, the, the ready-made uh, by 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 contrast. Uh, puts the emphasis more on, as you also pointed out, you know, social labor, which is the factory, which is seriality, and so forth. Of course, artistic labor is there as well, as I demonstrated, and artistic labor is associated with, with certain privileges which remain in the ready-made. That's why it's a commodity of a special kind. It's not a commodity like any other commodity, but it shares structural analogies with a commodity in a, in a, in a very specific way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, 
I, I agree, I agree. With one point in your presentation, I agree completely that it, uh, the ready-made in a way is essentially bound to the concept of authorship. So yeah. of this kind of privilege that, yeah. uh, that, that frames artistic production. And without and it, it wouldn't so work. That's so different with the com uh, than, the, than the ordinary commodity because the ordinary commodity is produced by workers who mobilize their labor force and who do not own this pro the, the product of their labor. So artistic labor is associated with all kinds of uh, privileges. This is why many Marxist art historians actually say that artistic labor has nothing to do with value production and should be exempted from it. I happen not to mm -hmm. think so, but this debate would now maybe go so too far because it's a kind of Marxological one. But I have a question to you as well, Sebastian. Um, um, two questions, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, one, uh, I had, I have had the impression that you are not so interested in the kind of um, in the iconographic dimension of Duchamp's ready-made. Because what always struck me is that many of these objects um, belong to the sphere of reproduction. You know, the comb, the clothes hanger, even the urinal. Are associated with a sphere of reproduction, with a private sphere. You could even say, say a, feel, a sphere that is usually associated as being a f the, f the, 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 the sphere of the female, as and, and, and so on. So, does this matter to you at all? Because I, I, I felt that this iconographic dimension is kind of not so much uh, present in your work. And could one maybe sa say that Duchamp? Uh, while putting the emphasis on this sphere of reproduction, which is, you know, declared to be the production, uh, does he intuit the, the increased economic importance of such a sphere in our economy? Uh, you know, when you think of Facebook, uh, it's our private lives. It's our, you know, it's our kind of most intimate, uh, uh, effective, effective labor. labor that so is there a kind of uh, intuition maybe of of the of the the increased value of this fear that we find in the ready made difficult question very interesting question i mean i'm i'm, I'm very interested in the iconography of the <laughs> of the ready mates uh, just that this was the most formal sketch uh, oh, I, I ever gave uh, about what i think is important in this uh, processal reading of the ready made and of the ready made mm -hmm. as the, in a way a carrier of a date um, which i think is the important link to the commodity form uh, in the ready made not the fetish but that you need something new so that you have a clean start. You cannot do it with something you found on the flea market. That's why I'm, uh, I am gave this very um, formal structure only. I'm, I'm very interested in the, in the iconography of the ready-mates, but I never thought about it in, in these terms that you offered now. I think it's quite obvious uh, and, and, and not uh, my invention, of course, that a lot of the ready-mates are clearly uh, related also to the iconography of the large glass. And uh, this is, I think, for me, this is basic and still not exhausted. I think there's still very uh, many open and very interesting questions. Um, and then, of course, the large glass has to do with body, has to do with sexuality, has to do with, uh, um, with ambiguous forms like the pissoir, which is also a mold of the piss in this sense. And, uh, or it's an inverted waterfall, or uh, you have the, um, uh, the, the, um, the cover of the typewriter cover, um, where we have an inside out, you have the coat hanger where you have the coats are not there. But so perhaps this really relates to what you asked about the concept of reproduction. Um, but I wouldn't know if I could uh, relate this or would, uh, if I would read this as a symptomatic um, um, Chris, uh, idea of Duchamp about about our contemporary uh, production sphere where private life is productive mm -hmm. or is is bound up to value extraction. But um, just my second question, uh, and then <laughs> sorry to, but I just had another um, moment where I kind of slightly shook my hand, uh, my my head when you when you uh, hand as well, of course. 
uh, when you referred, when you kind of stated that commodity is not an issue in the Duchampian ready-made. And I was thinking, you know, for, for me, if I only consider how much his, the display strategies that you can detect in his work are communicating with the display strategies, you know, of uh, shops. I, I, I really believe that the, the kind of structural analogies to the commodities and an insistence on the difference or the specificity of these artistic commodities is really a, an issue that is overlookable in his work. I was puzzled how you could say commodity is not an issue. Or maybe I misunderstood. I, 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 uh, at least I didn't put it uh, as strong as you um, now Sorry. frame it. Uh, <laughs> I said that the, um, it, that the identification of the um, of the, the artwork with the absolute commodity, that this topic that uh, comes up with, in a way, I said latently with something like Donald Judd, uh, um, uh, manifestly and programmatically, okay. with something like the silver clouds of uh, of Warhol. Um, that this identification is not the main issue in Duchamp's relation uh, of the ready-made and the commodity, but uh, I think that the commodity is in a way, or the serial product is in a way a, ne a methodological necess necessity uh, for the ready-made um, because it has to be something new um, to, or something unused, something that you, uh, that you find uh, on the other side of the shop window. Um, and still not individualized in a way, still not used, still not, still not contextualized. I think that's quite important. You don't find the urinal in, in, uh, in the toilet, uh, in the public toilet, uh, and then take it out of its former context. But the bottle but rack, you, you find it all over in households in France until today. Yeah, yeah but uh, the bottle rack, perhaps, uh, of course it's a difficult uh, question because we don't know exactly about the bottle rack, but uh, you find it uh, in the Bazaar de l'Hôtel de Ville. Um, it's a new one, and it's not something you don't find. Now you find it, of course, also in the flea market, but I think for, for Duchamp it's more important uh, that it has no prehistory. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, and that's done, in, in that's contrast guaranteed. With the ob that's the, the, in the contrast, contrast with the Objet Trouvé, yeah. which has yeah. comes from the First wo World War and means this well, or that. You know. <laughs> I could I could sorry. listen to this conversation for hours. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, <laughs> seriously, but perhaps that's not the case for everybody in our audience. Um, you know, but it's it's great because what we're doing here, of course, is we are performing the labor of interpretation, uh, which also actually stresses the point that with Duchamp, even though there seems to be a kind of consummation of you know a certain model of authorship in his practice, the artist doesn't even have to produce the work; the artist can choose the work, and it's it's his name or her name, but of course his name in Duchamp's case that uh, um, authenticates the work. Even though there is this kind of triumph, it seems, of the artist and his act as an act of choice in Duchamp, um, because he essentially gives us bits and pieces that we then have to work with, there is also a kind of distribution of labor that is already uh, um, underway um, at the time of the production or the selection of the works um, and it's very much, I would say, also actually a form of socialized labor. Duchamp would not have created the ready-mates if he had not been part of certain circles, late Cubist, Dadaist, um, surrealist circles. So I would say there is also a socialization here that has led to a contemporary situation in which we are indeed dealing with various forms of distributed authorship, and one could also connect that to uh, Simon's practice, which of course, you know, it's your practice, and we know you as Simon Denny artist, but we've seen in uh, pretty much all of your projects, and particularly perhaps in the case of the project at the EU, EU Parliament, there is, you know, there are so many forms of <coughs> collaboration and of the outsourcing of, of authorship actually that are uh, involved, um, which I think may be another um, unexpected relevance um, that we can um, that we can perceive in uh, in Duchamp. Um, I'm going, at op going to open it up to the audience. Uh, perhaps let me just uh, make one final point or reiterate something that Isabel said in her talk. The ready-made is not an innocent or emancipatory proposition, which I think can be quite a productive uh, thought. So we don't have to say, okay, there once was this wonderful thing created by Duchamp and then it became corrupted and it became speculative and so on. Uh, perhaps indeed the ready-made is an interesting and still productive problem uh, because it is not innocent or, or emancipatory, because it was problematic 
not necessarily in a purely negative way yeah. uh, to begin with. So it's a problem that we can still engage with and work with, which is precisely what all of you uh, have been doing, I think. And is there anybody in the audience who wants to continue with that process? Yes, over there. Uh, yeah, I have a uh, <coughs> quite short question, actually. Uh, the first is for Sebastian Egenhofer. Uh, I was interested by your cut in the next dimension, or by you know the, the line cut in the second dimension, the second dimension, the plane the cuts in the third dimension, and the third dimension, the volume cuts in the fourth dimension. So I, I, did I mis misunderstood you? Um, I mean, what I understood is that the grand vert uh, might be the action of being indifferent to a culture, or a society, and representing it, the, the various actors, narratives, belief systems, and uh, c uh, material constraints, to represent it, a society or a culture, in a 3D object. Um, and we basically consider that, you know, cultures are streams. Are we, we say, oh, this culture, but actually, it's always changing. And to say, oh, this culture makes us identify um, a start and uh, maybe an end, or maybe an open end. So basically, could we say the Grand Vert is some kind of um, uh, proposition that a culture, if we are not for or against it, because for example, we, we, we are young and we don't think about uh, being for against it, um, can be viewed as a, as a ready-made. A second question is for um, Isabel Gros. I, I thought, um, one of the, 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 the value of the classic artist... Uh, one question per row. Oh, oh, yeah, sorry. It's yeah, okay, sorry. Yes. I, I must admit that I ha didn't really understand uh, the question. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, because I, was, um, I listened to Marcel Duchamp, who commented that he... he, he made choices of things that he was indifferent to. Mm -hmm. And basically, the scarcity uh, of these choices was also important for him. Which, uh, we, mm. And um, so I was wondering, see, for example, in his Grand Vert, that is, let's say, three-dimensional, if he basically uh, put himself in, the, in a position of, of, of showing a culture or a society in a specific point of time as already made because basically uh -huh. we are maybe uh -huh. uh, thinking this is good in society or that is good or we are you know that that's a that's a complicated to thought at least um, the <laughs> of course the indifference of the uh, of the ready-made in the moment of choice that you uh, that you don't have to be interested in it that you don't uh, you neither have to like nor uh, dislike it is is of course an important point that this moment of decision is in a way also very clear and, 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 and that the machine in which the decision takes place in a way is stable and quiet and it that doesn't have to be any convulsive beauty or so and any excitement, aesthetic excitement. Um, but the, r the, the large glass, of course, is also a, a very complicated... Um, um, a very complicated auseinandersetzung uh, uh, with the culture and with the social roles that are um, that are prescribed by a culture, like in the in the in the malls of the of the bachelors, for example. Um, so I don't think that it is a machine that implies the indifference towards a culture. And I don't know how I would relate this indifference of the um, of the ready-made to the complicated iconography of the large glass in this respect. I, I cannot answer better at the moment. Um, yeah, here in the front. I don't even have a question, Dita, but uh, two comments that I feel compelled to make. I mean, you were talking, one is you were talking about the ready-made as eclipsing social labor and the question of authorship. I just want to point out that w with three ready-mades, you know, let's say with Underwood, the typewriter cover, has the name of the company on it. 
um, Duchamp, when it came to the urinal, he was always referring to Mott Ironworks, where he got his pun from, or at least in part, Richard Mott. Um, the comb that you keep referring to is, it has inscribed on it Chess F. Bingler with the address of the actual maker of that comb. So I do think that there is at least you know, some space when we look at the ready-mates that, that the actual labor behind making this is mentioned and is inscribed on those very important ready-mates. And the other thing, I mean, I very much like where the discussion is going, but in, when we talk about the ready-made market, I just want to say that I think that there's something in there for young artists when it comes to the artistic practice vis-a-vis -vis the market, why we're living in a time where the art world is almost at an exact overlap with the art market, for the better or for the worse. It was Duchamp who early on showed the way that it was important to him not to have his works be sold and resold at auction and, every, and everywhere else. He made very sure that his most important works would end up with very, very few collectors, and he would make sure that those collectors would give those works to very few museums, the Museum of Modern Art, um, the, you know, the collection in Yale, as well as, of course, most importantly, the Philadelphia Museum of Art. So the greatest trick of Duchamp as a trickster would also be that for such a long time, and only recently it has changed because there's only ephemeral works around, you know, he has been um, short-circuited the art market and did not play a role in it. Um, and I think that is, that is uh, a strategy in and of itself that I would wish young artists could learn more from as they start selling out at a very early age. Uh, I would like to answer. Mm -hmm. sure. Go um, ahead. First of all, I think that looking at the MUT inscription or the inscription on the typewriter Hülle, I don't, um, uh, one realizes that it's about acknowledging brands and this is not necessarily meaning that you know social labor is literally uh, emerging in these works and but what I try to say is that social labor yes is somewhat contained in the ready-made and rendered invisible in the same time so it's a kind of dialectic construction uh, what you say about Duchamp I think uh, uh, comes close to the kind of official legend because when one looks more closely and Dieter Daniels in his book uh, uh, Duchamp and the Andren has uh, uh, demonstrated that quite very convincingly. One realized that Duchamp was a dealer artist. And, you know, he was, was a force in the art market. Not only did he deal with Brancusis, he was also a kind of agent and uh, advised collectors and so on, Catherine Dreyer. I mean I, I mean, I think that this whole idea that he was outside is a fiction. Um, he didn't produce in a way that his colleagues would produce, like, you know, continuously, but he was definitely an agent in the art market. He kept the separation between being a dealer, for example, of Brancusi, and of being an artist who most of the time gave his work without much profit to trusted hands. So I think exactly this separation is what makes the model interesting of not intermingling what is not the normality today, you know. Well, I, I think like artists wearing different hats, being artists, dealers, writers, curators at times, um, is, is a model that is very widespread nowadays. I've called this in my book High Price the erweitertes Kompetenzprofil the enlarged competence profile. And I think it's always most interesting when the inner contradictions and tensions that result from these multiple hats are actually addressed in the work. I, I would have liked to ask Oliver Laric uh, from uh, who does these 3D scans uh, with a lot of money and work involved um, and gives them for free. <laughs> how this works um, <laughs> on the commercial side, but perhaps we can postpone this to the final discussion. By the way. Um, let's see, how are we doing time-wise? Uh, we do have five more minutes. I'm going to start to wrap things up. Um, are there any urgent questions that, yeah, there's one over there. Okay, then let's say that this is the final question, or at least the first final question. 
It's uh, just a little thought on the uh, relationship of the ready-made and the commodity fetishism. Um, Marx, as we all know, uh, probably uh, says that um, the exchange value, not the use value, the exchange value of the, of the commodity uh, seems to be something that is inherent in the object, but actually it's not, uh, because it's only a symptom, so to speak, of a certain kind of uh, social constellation. Um, and if we uh, transfer this thought to the ready-made, I think it's important to notice uh, that the ready-made is not um, a symptom of something that has happened uh, before, but it is something that will happen in the future. So it's uh, um, a symptom of the, the work, the labor that has to be done by the uh, recipi uh, recipients, uh, the, the, the people who look at, uh, the, you know, the regardeur. Uh, so it's uh, it's a completely turn around. It's not uh, the end of the process that uh, reflects uh, how it has come about, but it's the beginning of a process uh, that is going on, uh, so to speak, starting from nothing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, probably not. Fr I wouldn't say from nothing because uh, there there is first, of course, there is this in a way eclipsed. I still don't understand how. It couldn't be eclipsed. That's for me uh, still the point. No, yeah, of course, there it's not eclipsed. But the social labor that is produced in any kind of serial product is eclipsed in the product, whether it's already made or not, or whether it becomes already made or not. And uh, of course, if there's an uh, inscription on it from the uh, company or so, then one knows the company, but one doesn't see the labor in no, the no. in the product. Yeah, that's true but for every commodity. That's exactly. why the ready-made is structurally analogous to a commodity, mm. but it's also commodity of a special kind because of the privileges associated okay. with artistic labor that are also kind of sedimented in, in it. Yeah. And what, what I wanted to say, exactly, oh. this privilege, uh, this privilege lab labor of authorship is also, it's so complicated and to construct an author who is able to frame it, to date it, to have the connections to Alfred Stieglitz, to have this, uh, to conceive all this framework in which the retroactive or um, uh, the, the uh, pro uh, reception process by posterity takes place. Uh, this is a very complicated process, and so I don't think it's only from the future backwards, but it's also uh, constructed by by the author, by the artist, uh, and the artist himself, himself is a social construct also, in, uh, just in this sense. Yeah, yeah I, I, if I may also say one, one sentence about what you suggested, I think that <coughs> if we want to grasp you know, the, the value question. If, you, if we really want to understand um, how value is kind of founded in artworks, we first of all have to understand that they are never in value is never intrinsic. It's a kind of social relation. And we have, I think, we have to look at the sphere of artistic production, the sphere of labor and the results of this labor as much as on the sphere of artistic reception, the, the, the kind of collective desire that is projected on some works and not on others and therefore also constitutes value. So value is, I think, both founded in the sphere of production and in the sphere of reception. So I would half agree with you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, uh, and indeed, um, I think those are good. Uh, ah, there is another, is there a final, final two. question? There's two, okay. <laughs> Okay, let's be, let's be <laughs> tolerant. I would like to make a comment and end on a very kind of positive note. What I find is most interesting that Mr. Duchamp decided to live a very comfortable life. He fell in love with Tini Duchamp, Tini Matisse. She was used to a very comfortable life, business class flights, good hotels, and then he decided to make an edition of the ready-mades with Arturo Schwarz, which I think is a great momentum because he's making fun of this religious admiration of Duchamp. He lived his life in a very wonderful way. So the sense he's a great, a great fucking comedian. He is a genius because of that. And this whole labor issue, yes, but that is an issue, as Simon Denny proves, is not relevant anymore. 
under those circumstances you discuss them from a Marxist point of view. So the fact that change, he envisioned it and he made it possible. But don't get stuck in your historical uh, <laughs> stupid being caught in this. T talk about the future. Talk about the situation of the fucking question of the market. What does it mean for artists today? So we are talking about an issue which historically is significant, but you should end it on a positive note. Leben geht weiter. The, <laughs> you see the fact what happens that UNESCO, America leaves UNESCO. What does this mean? What does this mean politically? Duchamp was very smart to avoid political questions, right? He almost circumvented them completely. He, had a, he probably was a great lover, but all the women he was in love with had money. So he was an interesting character. These dandies don't exist anymore. There should be more of them in the future. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you for this intervention. I don't know, I don't know if... I don't know if at the moment if ending uh, uh, by discussing the future is the same as ending on a positive note, but is there anyone, uh, Simon or um, Isabel, or do you want to respond to that? Or do you? I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then we'll end it on that note. I think we need a couple of follow-up uh, symposia. We need a follow-up symposium on matters of labor and value. Is the Marxian labor theory of value um, uh, entirely obsolete, or does it still have some relevant? Is there a real autonomization of, of dead labor? Um, we need a follow-up symposium on matters of, of time and uh, duration. Uh, according to Rocher, Marcel Duchamp's greatest work was the use of time, l'emploi de son temps. Uh, this is something we've uh, touched on but haven't fully um, discussed. And um, we need uh, a follow-up uh, symposium on uh, many different uh, questions that we have raised without answering them. Uh, but thank you very much, um, everybody. And now, I think, Dieter, um, you want to say something straight away, right?